You're watching Weird US on the History Channel. We're here in Gibsland, Louisiana for the yearly reenactment of the bloody death of Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde not only had contempt for the law, but for life as well, even if those lives were their own. The outlaw couple fully expected that one day their lives would end in a storm of violence. The only question was when it would happen and where. This was where. And when was more than 70 years ago, as a posse of Texas lawmen caught up with them here and ambushed them on this lonely stretch of Louisiana Highway. In May 1934, Bonnie and Clyde are staying just outside of town, near the home of their accomplice, Henry Methvin, a man they freed from prison a few months earlier. Meanwhile, the police offer Methvin a pardon when he agrees to let them use his father's truck to lure Bonnie and Clyde into an ambush. It looks like the entire town of Gibsland is here to see the famous ambush. Even the Boy Scouts. Clyde Barrett is roaring down the road in his 1934 Ford. Among the locals, we meet Boots Hinton. Boots is the son of Ted Hinton, one of the Texas lawmen in the posse hunting Bonnie and Clyde. Boots tells us his dad, Ted, was a cop from Dallas who knew the couple and even had a crush on Bonnie from her waitressing days. He tried to get Clyde to come in. He sent word to him to, uh, that he'd be sure that he got all the way in. No one would shoot him on the way to the jail or if he got the electric chair that he'd walk the last mile with him. Clyde sent word back to him, said, Ted, don't try it, you'll just get killed. What brings people out here year after bloody year? It's Clyde Barrow. It's Barrow, sure. Having a little trouble with the car here. Truck. Having a little trouble here. Uh, what Ted said happened was that he was chasing the car up the road shooting at it. The car stopped over in the ditch. He jerked the door open on Bonnie's side and the uh, little lady was leaning up against the door and she fell out and he caught her. And he told me, he says, son, she was breathing when I caught her. But by the time I gathered her up to put her back in there, she wasn't breathing anymore. Her dad, both of them. Boots tells us that it's his father, Ted, who shot this footage. After he shot Bonnie and Clyde, that is. For the townspeople of Gibsland, then and now, this is rubbernecking at its best. In 1934, people do more than gawk. They swarm Bonnie and Clyde's corpses, scavenging for souvenirs. They cut off scraps of their bloody clothing and locks of Bonnie's hair. One man tries to cut off Clyde's trigger finger before the cops stop him. I guess crime doesn't pay. The end of Bonnie's poem reads, Someday they'll go down together, and they'll bury them side by side. To few it'll be grief, to the law a relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. They died in a barrage of nearly 200 bullets, but the question remains, why not surrender instead of fighting to the death? Well, the answer is obvious. If Bonnie and Clyde had surrendered, they would have been taken back to Texas and tried. Bonnie would have gone to jail, and Clyde would most likely have gotten the electric chair, a famous one called Old Sparky. It's been unplugged for 40 years, but we hear it's the main attraction in a museum one state over. Texas. We're on our way to Huntsville, Texas to find Old Sparky. If Clyde Barrow had been captured alive, he would have come home here to roast. We're about to enter a small town where 75% of the population are prisoners, and many people work for the prison system. Welcome to Huntsville, Texas, home of America's deadliest electric chair. This is the incarceration capital of the Lone Star State. 